Amazon is one of the largest companies in the world. It's the first place people go when they want to buy something, compare prices, or even just to window shop. In 2017, Amazon's market share of the US e-commerce retail market was 37%, and this percentage has only gotten larger as time has gone on and world events have directed more traffic away from physical stores and toward online shopping, reaching 47% in 2020. Nearly one in three Americans have a Prime membership, and those with this membership tend to spend an average of over $1,000 a year on the platform. At its core, Amazon's store is a way for people to shop online and have products delivered directly to their doorstep. But while Amazon played a significant role in adapting this concept to the internet, Jeff Bezos did not come up with the idea of skipping out on physical locations. So while some lament the end of brick and mortar locations, I want to dive into the original Amazons, because this practice has been going on for over 150 years. From things as simple as people ordering clothing to entire houses being delivered directly to you, we're diving into all of it and more. So get your credit cards ready and start looking for the postman as we learn something new. On November 8th, 1873, the Chicago Tribune issued a warning. Beware, don't patronize Montgomery Ward and company. They are deadbeats. They were going after Aaron Montgomery Ward, believing that the flyers he was posting were part of a swindling scheme, scamming people who lived in the more rural areas outside of Chicago out of lots of money by offering them utopian prices on a variety of over 200 different goods. This practice was even more suspicious because Montgomery Ward and company didn't have any of those goods in a shop, nor did he employ traveling salesmen to go around and sell them. But it was precisely for these reasons that Ward was offering those utopian prices in the first place. But let me back up a bit. Aaron Montgomery Ward was born in 1844 in Chatham, New Jersey. In his younger years, he worked for a general store as a salesman. While he traveled to rural areas, he became aware that the farmers resented him. He was a middleman. His role was to connect buyers, mainly the farmers in the rural areas, and the sellers, aka the general store, and he would take some of the cut for his services. But this also meant that the rural customers he was going out to meet would be charged more, and they knew it. This observation, as well as learning about a company formed in 1845 called Tiffany's Blue Book, which operated by selling high-end gemstones directly to consumers through mail orders, gave Ward an idea. He would buy goods wholesale and sell them by mail at a low markup, reducing many of the costs that normally drove up the price of doing business. His innovations would change how rural America got access to their goods. Ward started the business with his brother in Chicago in 1872, one of the top industrial centers in America at the time, that also was located fairly centrally near many rural areas. The mail order catalog initially had 163 items to order. Ward felt as though he was onto something big, but it was quite a rocky start, especially since his business model wasn't quite understood leading to the Chicago Tribune warning, telling people not to do business with him. It was also fairly difficult to actually ship many of the bigger items out to people, especially since the mail service didn't work like it does today. In rural America, mail would not be delivered directly to your doorstep. Farmers would often have to drive into town to pick up their own mail from the post office. This didn't dissuade Ward, though. He found that many rural customers were willing to buy a variety of goods and pick them up, including clothing, furniture, and hardware, if the price was right. Interest was garnered in his mail order business after he came up with and began promoting the business with the now famous phrase, satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Ward began sending his catalogs out in mass. The one page 163 item catalog grew to 32 pages in 1874. 152 pages in 1876, and nearly 1,000 pages by 1897. Business was booming, but now Ward wasn't the only shop on the block. In 1888, Richard Warren Sears started a business selling watches through mail-order catalogs in Redwood Falls, Minnesota. 
By 1894, the Sears catalog had expanded greatly, growing to 322 pages and featuring sewing machines, bicycles, sporting goods, and more. But the mail order tides were shifting. An event was coming that would change the mail order industry forever. In 1896, the United States Postal Service introduced a program of daily free home delivery and pickup of the mail, known as Rural Free Delivery, to rural towns and counties across the country. Before the introduction of RFD, areas of an average of 100 square miles shared one central post office, with no direct home or business delivery services. The time cost of using the central post office had been so large that most farmers and other rural citizens did not check their mail more than once a week. Having items delivered directly to their doorstep was a godsend for the rural community, which comprised over half of the United States population at the time. It not only saved farmers time, it also allowed them to put in more mail orders, bringing more business to Sears and Ward and Co. By 1897, Ward's workforce was over a thousand, and his company had become Chicago's leading user of U.S. mail, with annual sales of about $7 million. That's over $235 million in today's money. And Sears was wanting a bigger piece of that pie, trying subtle business practices at first, like making their catalog just slightly smaller than Ward's, so when stacking mail, theirs would feasibly be placed on top, where you would be more likely to see it, as well as providing a convenience to all rural Americans by making it out of paper soft enough to wipe with after going to the bathroom. But hey, at least that meant they didn't need to use corn cobs anymore. In all seriousness, if you want me to make an episode on the history of toilet paper usage and its alternatives, like the video and let me know in the comments section because I would love to do that if you're interested. From the 1890s to the 1910s, the mail order industry was dominated by Montgomery Ward and Sears. During this period, these companies became two of the largest business enterprises in the United States. Ward, which opened several mail order branches across the country during the first part of the 20th century, was employing over 7,000 men and women in the Chicago area by 1910. By 1913, Wards was selling about $40 million worth of goods per year, but Sears was quickly pulling away from the competition. By 1905, they had about 9,000 employees, and annual sales approaching $50 million. By the early part of the 20th century, the mail order retailing business led by the Chicago Giants had become a major sector of the American economy, through which millions of rural consumers purchased a variety of goods. This development, which was part of a general trend in which commodity consumption by individuals and households was taking on greater economic and cultural significance, was both embraced and resisted. By 1919, Americans were buying over $500 million worth of goods a year from mail order companies. For many consumers, the kind of mail order retailing pioneered by Wards and Sears offered a wider variety of goods, more generous credit terms, and lower prices than they could get from local merchants. Farmers groups, which tended to favor the bypassing of economic intermediaries, were supporters of mail order businesses from the very beginning. Local merchants, on the other hand, fought the national mail order houses in both economic and political arenas, with the local mom and pops feeling shut out by the two behemoths, something that many can relate to even today. But then came the amazing potential of these companies. In an effort to compete for product variety, they began selling houses. Yes, whole houses, but it was more of the IKEA variety. Strictly speaking, you would be sent lumber, lath, shingles, millwork, flooring, ceiling, finishing lumber, building paper, pipe, gutter, sash weights, hardware, and painting material, along with the plans to put it all together. People in the early 1900s were cultivating the idea of the American dream, with white picket fences and modest homes, and Sears decided in 1908 that they would try their best to fulfill that dream. Until 1940, a family could buy anything they needed to complete their home from the catalog. The pieces that arrived in the mail were supposed to be very user-friendly, fitting together almost like Legos or Lincoln Logs so that buyers could feasibly build it themselves. 
from 1908 to 1940, anywhere from 70 to 75,000 of these homes were purchased and constructed. The crazy part is, many of these mail order kit houses are still standing, over 100 years later. Some have even changed hands for more than $1 million. Mail ordering would eventually fall from its former glory. During the second half of the 20th century, the original two mail order giants and their catalog operations faltered, but other local companies prospered in what continued to be a major industry. By the 1970s, when the mail order business accounted for about a third of US postal revenues, most catalog customers lived in urban areas. But these mail order sales, as well as those at the company's brick and mortar stores, were no longer very profitable. During the 1980s and 1990s, both Wards and Sears stopped issuing their big catalogs. The death of Wards in 2000 was a final sign that the age of the Chicago mail order giants was over. Sears wouldn't be too far behind. But as the mail order catalog came to a close, the dynamics which allowed its rise began to play out once again, in a new cycle. As Amazon shied away from focusing on book sales and focused on sourcing from suppliers, they once again found a way to cut out inefficiencies and improve supply chains, resulting in a better delivery experience for less cost to the consumer. In many ways, the mail order services laid the framework for what the online mega corporations would become, for better or for worse. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. If you like this video and want to see more, like and subscribe for future videos. Also, I'm on Twitter now. I've noticed that for so many of my videos, I have really interesting facts that just don't fit in with the story as well, and often end up getting cut for time. I'm going to start posting some of those over there, including one for this episode, which will be posted at the same time as this video. Once again, thank you so much for your support, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.